Hello everybody, it's Trey. I'm participating in this year's Paleo Rewind, and I took the month of December. Make sure you check out Adaposaurus' video for November, and stick around till tomorrow to see the complete video with everyone's sections included here on Edge. Parasaurolophus neck meats. One of the most well-known and easily recognizable duckbill dinosaurs is Parasaurolophus. It's been known to science since the 1920s, and quickly became one of a small group of mascot dinosaurs in popular culture, no doubt because of that tubular crest. The very first specimen was found around 1920 by a team of rock nerds from the University of Toronto. This first specimen became known as the holotype for Parasaurolophus walkeri, and therefore had great bearing on how this group of dinosaurs would be reconstructed into the future. This first specimen carries with it evidence of a tough life. This guy or gal had a series of unfortunate events that left their mark on its skeleton in the form of ossifications, pads of bone overgrowths, healed fractures, teeth diseases, and bent neural spines. A team of six scientists re-examined the first specimen to fully describe the pathologies preserved and to provide a more accurate reconstruction of how it would look in life based on decades more hadrosaur research since its original description. The results found this individual, Parasaurolophus, suffered from periododontal disease and was hit by a large object at some point before its death. Periododontis is a disease of the gums which occurs as a result of bacterial infections of the teeth and gums from a buildup of plaque. It can lead to tooth and jawbone loss. This saddle-like dip in the specimen's spine is not natural and is a result of a collision with an object I mentioned earlier. Whatever this object was, probably a log or rock, it caused the neural spines of these vertebra to bend outward. This bending broke the bones which healed themselves by producing extra bone to hold themselves together. That extra bone is seen here as what the authors call a discoidal overgrowth. It's also seen right here referred to as a callus. As a result of the spine fractures, the ribs were also cracked and show healing through bone remodeling. A part of the pelvis, called the ilium, also shows some wear and tear. See this poking bit? That's not supposed to look like that. It's supposed to look like this. It's unclear if this extension of the pelvis, called a peduncle, is a result of the same event, which bashed the front of the dinosaur, or if it was a separate event, but the authors suggest it may have been a secondary result. Poor thing couldn't catch a break. Thanks to the reanalysis of the broken neural spines, the authors found a better way than previously thought to reconstruct the ligaments, which held up the head. A ligament is a tough, fibrous connective tissue which connects bone to bone. In modern archosaurs, crocs, and birds, this structure attaches the back vertebra to the base of the head and neck to support the skull. They are called neutral ligaments, and their arrangement in non-avian dinosaurs as well as the hadrosaurs has been in question for quite some time. When it comes to the birds and crocs, the neutral ligaments usually only attach to either the axis vertebra or the back of the skull. It's been hypothesized that the neutral ligaments ran the entire length of the spinal column in sauropod dinosaurs, but this doesn't work out for duckbills. They have ossified tendons arranged in a latticework across the neural spines to help keep the spinal column ridge. These tendons have only been found to start around the 7th to 9th back vertebra. This then corresponds to the pathology seen in the first Parasaurolophus specimen. This is exciting because it allows the authors to make a much better assumption of where the neutral ligaments might attach in both Parasaurolophus and all hadrosaurs potentially, confirming they had extremely beefy necks to hold up their instrumented noggins. The authors conclude with what they think is the most likely arrangement of ligaments illustrated in this diagram. Ubirajara Controversy the front half of a small Compsagonathid dinosaur was described by a few paleontologists in mid-December as Ubirajara jubitus. It preserves some amazing integument. First of all, the fossil comes from a Brazilian lagostata. A lagostata is a sedimentary rock deposit which preserves most of the soft tissue of organisms that die, and are covered by the sediment due to a variety of factors, namely a lack of oxygen. The decayed sludge that once made up the skin and internal organs is preserved as a carbon film and impression in the torso. The most impressive thing about the fossil is preservation of some sections of tufts of hair-like filaments from the midline of the back, the neck, and the arms, as well as two pairs of rectangular ribbon-like feathers which probably attach to the shoulders to signal to other Ubirajara. The real kicker for this find is that it might be illegal. 
Two of the authors, Eberhard Frey and David Martill, note in the paper that the fossil was exported legally in 1995 with all the necessary permits. However, the truth is likely more hazy and sketchy, shall we say. Many Brazilian researchers familiar with the laws noted that since at least 1990, Brazilian regulations have explicitly prohibited the sale or permanent export of fossils. The alleged permits were sent out via email to a few experts and have since been contested by other scientists. According to Felipe Lima Pinheiro, the letter discusses transportation of the fossils but doesn't go into any details on the fossils themselves, their descriptions, how big the boxes were, or more. The document is also missing any information about the authorized personnel, no identification numbers and passports. There's nothing to give any hard sense of credibility. If you're operating as a scientist trying to describe fossils from another country, there are a set of assumed customary things you should do. You should A, have everything you need, B, aren't really being a jerk to the country you got the fossils from, or the people who gave you the fossils, and C, know all the context surrounding the fossils. A detailed description is required. You aren't just receiving a random box of fossils. You have to describe what the fossils are and determine where it was deposited. The fossil itself has to be logged as part of a Brazilian collection before it can be authentically sent off to scientists abroad. This process can take a while, and the specimens must be returned after a given date. As bureaucratic as this sounds, it is the law of the land, and a foreign scientist is expected to be professional and follow the law. I'll spare you the specifics, but needless to say the context surrounding the specimen is sketchy and dirty to say the least. Several individuals involved have been associated with illegal smuggling activities in the past, so this shouldn't really be a surprise. Many have noted a clear disregard among some of the researchers for following the proper protocol and laws set about by the Brazilian government. In addition to an overall lack of respect and cooperation with Brazilian researchers and institutions. All this sadly sours the taste of this otherwise fascinating discovery and specimen. A large portion of the paleo community has protested for Ubirajara's return to its native country and Brazilian researchers. Hopefully this whole mess will be sorted out in due time. To make an omelette, break some eggs. Everyone remembers the oviraptor egg thief myth, right? Some old foggies found an oviraptor skeleton atop a clutch of eggs and assumed it was trying to eat them before it died. Turns out those eggs belonged to the oviraptor and it was guarding them. That specimen was named Big Mama and also wasn't an oviraptor. Rather, it was a city potty, a very similar closely related animal. Turns out fossils like Big Mama keep being dug up. The latest was described this December by a multi-regional team of experts. This specimen is a pretty well-preserved nest of eggs containing a bunch of embryonic skeletons, as well as most of the core of the mother's body. The paper doesn't name the critter since there really isn't enough verifiable parts preserved. The most important aspect of this finding are the embryonic skeletons. Many recent studies on avian and non-avian dinosaurs have shown that many characteristics we associate with the avian line dinosaurs evolved incrementally over deep time. This has also been countered by a slew of other characteristics of advanced avian dinosaurs that pop up independently among different groups of both avian and non-avian dinosaurs, suggesting the opposite of incremental evolutionary changes. This new oviraptosaur specimen is the first specimen to preserve the skeleton of an adult atop a clutch of eggs that contain really good embryonic remains. This all means that the brooding hypothesis for theropod dinosaurs is supported. Before, the specifics were unknown, so no one could really say whether the parent died protecting the eggs, brooding the eggs, or if they left before they hatched. The embryonic skeletons also show a difference in development, meaning this dinosaur experienced asynchronous hatching. The mother laid some eggs, then got preggers again, and laid a second set of eggs in the same nest so that different sets would hatch at different times. This all proves that the evolution of reproductive biology is super complex among different groups of avian and not avian dinosaurs. It's not just a stepladder. Australia's Swamp King Australia is known primarily for its crocodilian fauna. Not only is it chock full of crocs now, but it has been for millions of years. One particular croc from the Pleistocene is as dangerous as it is mysterious. 
a new paper led by PhD student Jorgo Rybzewski with the University of Queensland redescribes the remains of a croc first identified over 130 years ago. In the late 1800s, the crocodilian Palumnarchus pollens was erected out of a collection of fragmentary remains. This crocodilian comes from the Pleistocene of the island continent and would have been about the same size as the largest species of crocs alive today, the saltwater crocodiles. The big difference with this species was its extremely robust giant noggin, resulting in a look that was like a cross between a croc and a gator's jaws. It turns out the original bunch of fossils included a lot of stuff that really didn't have a lot of good characteristics to describe a genus with. It was also found that the material probably contained more than one animal. The team found the original material to be too poorly preserved to hold up the name, so they took the better fossils and gave it a new name since it was more distinct from the holotype. They named this better specimen Paludirex vincenti, Vincent's Swamp King. 